Hey, everyone. Good morning on Central Standard Time and Pacific Time. Good morning to every or good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Bear with me another minute or two, and then we'll get started. All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you are having a great Saturday and looking forward to talking about one of my favorite topics, prospecting. This is Bob Knackle. For those of you who don't know me well, just a 30-second background. I've been a broker in New York for 39 years selling investment property. I have, for 26 of those years, had my own company, which I sold to Cushion and Wakefield in 2014. The company was very fortunate to achieve a significant amount of success. And it was because we focused a lot on training. We had a great system and it was something I feel like I, I'm a student of the business and love the business. And so happy to share with you the things that, you know, I've come to learn about the business over the years. And one of the things that I think is critically important is prospecting. And I will tell you, I'll start out by, by saying <clears throat> there, are, there are no magic bullets or secret sauces to investment brokerage. And I also say, you know, we're talking about brokers. I also mentioned in, in a couple of the posts I put up that I thought investors could benefit from this session also. And I do believe that's the case because I think we all should be prospecting, whether whether we're investors or brokers, if you're an investor, you need to be developing relationships with, with brokers and also, I think, with potential sellers, because I think investors get really good deals when they're able to work directly with a seller. But And then clearly in the brokerage business, developing relationships with potential clients and finding out and determining how to access them and get in the way of those opportunities is, is critically important. So no, no magic secret sauces here. This is just good old fashioned blocking and tackling, but prospecting is, is very, very important. And I'll also say that, you know, this is just a system that has worked very successfully for me. It's not going to work for every, I think it will work for everybody, but you don't have to be a prospector to succeed. There are a lot of people who do everything by the book and don't succeed. And there are some people that can be undisciplined and succeed. All we're talking about here is trying to increase the probability that you succeed. And if you are successful, and this is a very important point, I think, if you're successful without a prospecting system, I think you can be so much more successful if you do have a prospecting system. And one of the things that I'm really blown away by is that so many people who are successful in our business don't have a prospecting plan and could be so much more successful if they did have one. So what we're going to talk about today, again, is if you want to adopt a prospecting plan, which I assume if you're listening today, you probably do. I think that the perspectives and tips that I'm going to share with you today will greatly increase your probability for success. And the, the key to doing it is to actually do them, to implement these things and to keep track of them. So I, I think, you know, the most important takeaway from, from this discussion today is going to be that in, in all sales, you can approach things either proactively or reactionary. And I think the people who I've seen that succeed the greatest within our business are those that are very proactive about what they, they do. Proactive professionals take the time to step back from the day-to-day -day grind or the, the whirlwind, as we call it, of working in your business. When we, we're trying to sell properties, trying to do deals, we're working in our business. But the folks who are proactive take a step back and work on their business. And working on your business you know, consists of strategic planning, setting goals, implementing effective time management, 
those are all aspects of a disciplined and intentional program. And that's what you want to have. But part of any plan that you have as a, a broker, you want to have a prospecting plan. It's the most important thing you can do. And all over the years, I've observed and mentored hundreds of brokers in the investment sales space. And I can tell you that this is one of the things that we relied on most heavily or focused on most heavily, stressed most heavily in our training was prospecting. And the the success of prospecting just speaks for itself. I can tell you today, one of the things that I'm most proud of about what Nasty Knackle, my old company, did is the way that we trained people and taught fundamentals to people. And today, the proof's in the pudding. There are 14 investment sales brokerage companies or divisions that are either owned by or run by ex Nasty Knackle people today. And I think that's a testament to the training that we provided and, and the real emphasis on prospecting that we had. So, you know, I think it, it also became very clear to us that the folks who did the best in the business were those who adopted a prospecting plan. And those folks just simply made more money than, than people who didn't. So I think by implementing a plan, you can you can definitely increase your earnings, make that that earn those earnings less volatile, more consistent. And again, if you've been in the business for a while and you you've done a lot of deals and you have relationships with people, you can continue to do really well that way. I had one broker once told me, you know, as an intermediary, I need to react to my clients. I need to be at their beck and call. When they call me, I have to respond immediately. And that broker was right that we do have to serve our clients, but being in control of your time and being disciplined about what you do, when you do it, how you do it actually puts you in a better position to service your clients. And you can do a better job for that client by sticking to your plan to become a better professional than to just reacting to their, their whim, their, when they call you know, you want to be reactive, but don't drop everything you're doing. So I think you, you want to keep this in focus that and we're going to talk about the different things that you can do or should do to, to stick to a, a plan and have that plan be very effective for you. And if you look at any textbook or book written about selling anything, you'll see it tells you that you have to have a target group of prospects to focus on. And that is really the first step in this process is have a target group. You know, you, if you've listened to my, my other spaces or, or heard me talk about brokerage, I say to explain it very simply, I use the example of uh, if we were going to go to Iceland and start a rock brokerage business, how would we do it? We, I know nothing about the market. I know nothing about anybody there. I would say, okay, well, let's make up a list of everybody that owns rocks. Let's make up a list of everybody that buys rocks. Let's try to understand the market, study the market, and then build relationships with the people that own rocks so that when they want to sell them, they'll give us the exclusive. And then we would get the exclusive and call all the people that want to buy rocks. That simply is what brokerage is. And I think to, to implement a successful prospecting plan, you have to have a target audience to focus on. And that target audience is going to be something that uh, should, you should be able to quantify in terms of a specialization. And you've heard me, I'm a huge proponent of specialization as a way to differentiate yourself from other people to become a true market expert. I think that in the investment sales world, that target audience should be between 1,000 and 1,200 people. That probably will, will relate to about 5,000 to 10,000 properties that those 1,000 to 1,200 people own. But I think that's a size audience that you can get to effectively, regularly, effectively, et cetera. So, you know, whether you're selling commercial real estate, shoes, oil, pencils, you need to identify a potential, who your potential clients are, 
and then repetitively and consistently stay in front of those prospects to remain top of mind. And top of mind is really, really important. People are not always wanting to transact, but when they do want to transact, you want them to think of you before they think of anybody else. So when you're, you're doing this outreach to your, your target audience, you want to do it in five primary ways. One, phone calls, two, emails, three, texts, four, hard mail. And hard mail, I think, is very, very underrated. I encourage you all to do hard mail as often as you can. And then face-to-face meetings. And I, I think while well, we're talking about prospecting today, the main focus is going to be on phone calling, which is you know where most of our prospecting is done. So when we start on a call program, it consists of the dreaded cold call. You know, people generally hate making cold calls to people they don't know. These are the most difficult calls to make. Most people don't enjoy it. But if you're repetitively contacting these people, you're going to be speaking to them many times. And then before you know it, you've, you've spoken to the person, you, you develop a relationship and the call becomes a warm call as opposed to a cold call. But, you know, there are times when cold calling is not so great and you're going to get hung up on. And, uh, you know, who likes getting hung up on, right? So, you know what? Good prospectors don't mind getting hung up on. And let me explain why that is. That might sound counterintuitive, right? But good prospectors like that for a number of reasons. What does, what does it tell you? When you call a property owner, get them on the phone, introduce yourself, and they slam the phone down on you. Do you think that's a total waste? I don't think so, and here's why. One, you have the correct phone number for the client, right? That's a good thing. A lot of times it's tough to get the right phone number. You had the right phone number. Second thing it tells you is that the owner probably doesn't want to transact today. If they wanted to transact and have a real estate person on the phone, unlikely they're going to hang up. And I think that client has the potential to be a great client because they're not just going to chat with anyone. After all, they don't know you. You don't have a relationship with them. And you call them and they just slam the phone down on you. So they're probably doing that with everybody. But if you are consistently reaching out to them and calling them and emailing them and texting them and hard mailing them, they're more likely to speak with you the next time you call. And once you have a relationship, they'll continue to speak to you and hang up on everybody else. So I actually think that 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 is a very positive aspect of of the hang up. And there's a fourth thing, too. And that fourth thing that's great about the hang up call is you're one call closer to getting the yes. And I think that having the proper mindset to make these prospecting calls is super important. And just to use as an example, Manhattan as a microcosm of this and what the the expectation of the productivity of the call is in Manhattan, south of 96th Street, there's 27,649 buildings. So the average turnover rate of that stock of buildings annually for the past 39 years has been about 2.6%. So that means an average of 718 properties sell in the average year in Manhattan. So if you make the assumption that half the stuff that goes on the market actually trades, that means only about 5% of the stock will be on the market at any one time, which means that if you make the assumption one owner owns one property, that means one out of every 20 calls will have the desired effect or will will lead to somebody who says, yes, I'm interested in potentially selling my property. Now, the, the numbers are different because people own multiple buildings, et cetera, et cetera. But if we just use that as a base, from that perspective, if, you, if you're making your prospecting calls and get hung up on 19 times in a row, the probability of success on the next call is very high. And that is the perspective that the successful prospector has. It's not that, oh my gosh, I'm getting hung up on. I'm getting hung up. People are not talking to me. They don't want to 
listen to what I have to say. You can't get discouraged by that. You have to have the feeling that, hey, this is a probability business. Every call I make, I'm getting closer to a successful one and not get discouraged by by the, the setbacks that you will inevitably get. So after making a few round of these cold calls, they're going to start to become warm calls. And one of the, the things that is so important, do not call somebody and just say, hey, I'm so-and-so at this company. Do you want to sell your building? That is the best way to have people not think that you're, you're giving them anything of value or, or to think you're just another broker looking for the next deal. Purpose of the call is to develop a relationship with that owner. So number one, offer them something of value offer them information on a property that just sold, something you have on the market to sell, a market report that you've just done. I ask them if they'd like to see the white paper that you just wrote on a certain trend that's happening in the market that might impact the value of their property. Give them a reason to want to talk to you. Offer them something of value. You always want to do that first and then get around ultimately to asking if there's anything in their portfolio you want to sell, but you cannot lead with that. You need to offer something of value and then ultimately get around to asking if they, they, if they have any interest in selling. So, so how, do you, how do you develop a relationship with somebody? I'm a firm believer that if you put any two people together in a room for 20 minutes and they talk to each other with probing questions, they'll find something that they have in common. And if you can find that one thing you have in common that you really, truly enjoy, whether it's being a fan of NASCAR or a local sports team or grilling or traveling or wine tasting or whatever, if you can find something that you on a truthful basis both really enjoy, that's the basis of a a great relationship and something that you can build on. So you want to ask questions about uh, the person, maybe Google them before you get on the phone with them, see if you could find out something about them. And, you know, that I, I have clients who, you know, the, the first couple of minutes that we talk, when I call them up to find out if they, they're interested in selling anything, we talk about the Rangers or the, the Knicks or the Yankees or about the, uh, the best wine that he's tried recently. And so you want to connect on more than just a, hey, I'm here to do a real estate transaction basis. And that becomes something that you can build a relationship on. Okay, so there's two two main sections that I want to talk about when it comes to prospecting. One is what is the the value of, of prospecting? And and then I'll give you a bunch of tips for the s- successful creation and implementation of a comprehensive prospecting plan. So let's look at the the value of prospecting. So prospecting provides you with valuable feedback from the from the marketplace. Right? If you're talking to a bunch of folks who own property, you they, and you talk you talking to them and having good conversations, you're going to get a lot of information in those calls and you'll identify new opportunities, you're going to become familiar with emerging trends obtain market info, which you can use with other prospects or to enhance the marketing materials you're putting together, or maybe they give you an idea for a marketing report that you want to write. And you also, it gives you the ability to talk about the properties that you're selling, get feedback from them on questions they're asking or things you might want to stress in your marketing materials. And it it gives you feedback in terms of how the marketplace is viewing the market, the listing you're talking about, what their buying appetite might be. But number one, the number one value is the feedback you get will help shape your perspective on what's happening in the market. And you can share that perspective with others. Number two value that I think prospecting gives is it forces you to identify a specific message that you want to have resonate with your target audience. You're calling people in your, your target audience. They, they have some commonality because they're in this group of specialized property types or geographies or whatever it is that you're, you're specializing in. But 
you want to think about not don't just call people up and say, hey, you know, you you're interested in transacting in any way. You want them before you make your calls, think about what do you want the person to remember after they get off the phone with you? Have a specific message that you want to convey. So what do you want the prospect to remember about you after the call is over? And this will force you to clearly and succinctly be able to articulate your value proposition. Why are they talking to you? Why should they be talking to you? Why should they call you when they want to transact? So what's your value proposition? What do you do? How do you do it? Why are you different from everybody else? You know, when I'm, when I'm marketing uh, and I'm making prospecting calls to potential development site sellers, I'm letting them know that, you know, the overwhelming majority of my practice today is selling development sites. And I know what the pipeline of new construction is for each of the different food groups. And I know how many sites have sold and I know what the average price is per, per buildable foot are. And I have different research projects I'm working on and I convey those to people. And if they care about the value of their property, they're going to want to hear that stuff. So have a, a very clear value proposition that you can articulate. And also in those calls, when you're talking about the market, it's your chance to make a great impression on somebody, especially the, the earlier calls. But the, the number one question you're going to get from clients is, how's the market? And as I always say, have statistics that you can respond with. Anyone can respond with adjectives. Nobody cares if the market's hot or challenging or you're busy. They want to know that 862 transactions happened last year, and this year the market's on pace to 621. That, should, that, that in itself tells you, wow, that person really understands the market. They can bring value to me. They can help me create value in my portfolio. So things like that, being a, be having a value proposition that you can clearly articulate, being able to answer questions about how the market is with statistics, those things are going to be those differentiators that we're all looking for. And being able to differentiate yourself in that way creates a competitive advantage, and that competitive advantage is a keystone for success in this business. So you want to be viewed as a trusted advisor and a valuable resource, not as a commodity. Just that you don't want to be viewed as another of the thousands of brokers that are trying to put deals together. You want to be viewed as someone who really could create value for that particular client and, and enhance the value of their portfolio based on the information that you can share with the client. Okay, number three value of, of implementing a prospecting plan is it gets you out of your comfort zone. And getting out of your comfort zone increases your value because it gets you to think about things on your feet. You have to respond to out-of-the-box questions. People will ask you things out of left field. And if you think about it, this is a, a great way to kind of go through trial by fire. You don't want to be asked those questions. The, the Super Bowl of what we do is when you're in that presentation pitching business, right? You, you're in front of a client. They want to sell. They want to hear what you have to say. You don't want to be trying to answer a question for the first time in that pitch. So prospecting is a great training ground where people are hopefully are going to be throwing all kinds of questions out at you. If you stumble answering, you're going to be stumbling just in front of one person who may, may or may not have anything to do for you at that particular time. But better to, to be out of your comfort zone then than when you're in a pitch and it really counts. So it's a great training ground to, for, for, to answer these questions. Write the questions down if you have trouble answering them, and then you can put yourself in a position to more articulately answer that question if it came up in a pitch. But the more practice you have, the better. So that I think is a big value of prospecting. A fourth value, having a prospecting plan forces you to be disciplined. And disciplined is one of the most important characteristics 
of people that I see do really, really well in the business. You have to proactively allocate your time to make calls. If, if you are not blocking out time, not for this week coming up, but for next week, if you're, if you're really busy, if you're active in this business, if you looked at your calendar for next week, you can't block out four or five blocks of time for two or three hours that you could make calls. You just won't be able to. You have too many things going on. Too many things are in that calendar already. But if you, if you look at the following week, you probably have the ability to block those chunks of time out. And that's really important because you want to commit. If you committed to making your calls, you need to have the time to do it. You need to proactively block that time out. And it, it is in a situation where you're creating an environment where you're consciously setting priorities and setting priorities will allow you to grow your business. Fifth benefit or fifth value of prospecting is that if you're on a regular prospecting plan, it's the best insurance you possibly could have to increase the likelihood that you're going to avoid to the greatest extent possible the inevitable volatility within your income stream in the brokerage business, right? Income, income for brokers, very, very volatile, volatile, always has been, always will be, not much you can do about it, but you can minimize the, the volatility by having a prospecting plan. Prospecting will allow you to keep putting stuff in the front of the deal pipeline all the time. And so, you know, if you, if you're just moving along and doing business with the same clients you've been working with for a while and they're great clients and all of a sudden that client decides, oh, I'm not going to transact anymore. That's fine because you'll have a steady flow of new, new clients that are coming in. And that's really, that's the sixth value of prospecting is that it allows you to consistently increase and expand your client base. And, you know, those benefits are obvious. So those are our six very tangible benefits of having a prospecting plan. Now let's talk about, about the tips for, for creating and implementing the plan. Okay, so number one, clearly create a target list of prospects. And I really think, again, I, I wish I could talk about mortgage brokerage or, or leasing or property management, if you're in those fields, I, I don't know those fields well, but when it comes to building sales, I really think a thousand to 1200 prospects is what that, that main target audience can be. Certainly you could have others, you could have thousands. I mean, I have close to 20,000 people on a variety of lists that I reach out to in various ways with various different, different cadences. But but your main group of prospects should be a thousand to twelve hundred, and you're going to be attacking those targets systematically and consistently. You know what are the cl- ca- the common characteristics that these folks have that they that should be consistent with your area of specialization. And when you when you're dealing with a group that has a commonality it's much easier to have a message that resonates with them to convey a value proposition. And again, that specialization is so important because you, it will differentiate you from everybody else. And again, that will provide that competitive advantage that you're looking for. Number two, you have to allocate time. We talked about allocating time. You have to do it two weeks in advance, block the time out. If you don't block the time out, you're not going to make your prospecting calls guaranteed. There's always something to do. There's always an email to look at, a social media platform to go on and see what hap- what's happening, a phone call to pick up. Allocate the time early. Block the time out in your calendar. And don't let anything uh, get in the way of you sticking to that time. And, you know, it's so important. Allocate the time. Stick to it. Now, I have a question for all of you I want you to think about. Who is your best client? Right now, think about who's your best client. And I know that you're probably thinking, all right, well, who have I done the most transactions with? Who have I made the most money with? Is it uh, this, this lady who's hired me to sell 
16 properties? Is it this guy who, you know, every year he's giving me five buildings to sell? Okay, so do you have that that best client in mind? If you you like most folks, including myself, before this became apparent to me, you're wrong. Your best client is you. Your best client is you. You know why? Because no one will ever make more money for you than you will. No one will ever make more money for you than you will. So the importance of making these calls, allocating your time and making them and sticking to it is so critically important. When you, when you have your time blocked out, let everyone around you know not to disturb you when you're making those calls. I sat for, for 36 of my 39 years doing this. I sat in the middle of the bullpen and I had a signal to my team. I had a red baseball hat. My coach, Rod Santamassimo, gave me the idea. It was brilliant. I put the hat on. People knew, hey, when BK has the hat on, don't go ask him a question. Don't talk to him. He's making his calls. So unless my house is on fire or my wife or my daughter had a broken bone or there was blood somewhere, I was not being dissuaded from making my calls. And you have to you have to have some kind of a signal. Let the people around, you know, no interruptions, no nothing. Stay true to this program and get those calls done because you're your you are your best client. OK, fourth tip, make sure you have a list of people before you start dialing. And, you know, I'm very old school. If you follow me, you know, I, I do things in an analog way. I have written lists of people that I call. Whether you have a written list or you have it in, in, in the computer or using a CRM or whatever, I don't care where you, how you have it, but have a list of people and know you're going to churn through as many of those as you possibly can. If you have a two-hour block of time or a three-hour block of time to make your calls, have a list that is way longer than that, that you can never get to all those people in that period of time, but just sit there and go through it and make sure you have that list before you start. Number five, have a specific value proposition that's going to be your main theme for calls that day. What message do you want to convey? What do you want the client to remember about the call after you're done? You know, clearly we all want to call. We want to speak to somebody, introduce ourselves and have them say, oh, they're so glad you called. I want to sell my building. But that is unlikely to happen. So think about what you want the client to remember about you after you're done with the call and have talking points laid out have a value proposition that you can convey and make sure that that you're, you're making these calls very purposely. Sixth tip, listen. Prospects, when you're talking to them on the phone, are telling you more than you know. Why are they interested or not interested in the property that you're offering? Did they understand why you're calling? Did you articulate your value proposition clearly? What's the client doing? And why are they doing it? Ask them, what's next? How can I help you? What do you want to achieve this year? How, how, do, you, how do you view changes in your portfolio for this year? What questions are they asking you? Questions that are asked sometimes can be very telling, very leading questions. So I think you want to listen very intently for signals that the client's giving you. And the, the last tip is to remember that undedicated and sporadic prospecting leads to sporadic income. So I think if you want to smooth out the, the peaks and valleys of, of earnings, be on a prospecting plan that is very regular, very intentional. And I think if you implement this, I guarantee you're going to make more money than you're making if you're if you're brokering without having a prospecting plan. Just try it. Try it for a month. Try it for four weeks, and just see the 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 way you are interacting with clients. It will be very very different. Your market knowledge is going to go up. Your number of leads will go up. 
And I think it's a, it's a great thing. I firmly believe in it. I still make my calls every week. Number one thing on my to-do list is to get my connections done. My goal since the pandemic started has been to get a hundred connections, which means a, a, a property owner on the phone and get around to asking them if there's anything in their portfolio they want to sell. But even if I talk to an owner for an hour, if I don't get around to asking them or I forget to ask them if they have anything they want to sell, it doesn't count as a connection. So last year, I think my average is 114 connections a week. And uh, I think my pace this year is maybe a couple less than that, but pretty close. And uh, you know, I really encourage you to do it. I think it'll change your 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 brokerage career if you implement this. So happy to take some questions. I've been chewing your ear off for a while now, but happy to open it up for some questions. And let me see if I can get those questions. And I see there are questions. And again, technology, not my friend. So let me see. Mo, I'm going to see if I can get you on to, to, speak. Hopefully you can find the questions and just bear with me for a second. And Mo, I'm having the same trouble trying to make you the speaker as I am. Hold on, Mo. Speakers, here we go. I think I may have this. It is a speaker. All right. Knackle has figured out technology. Okay. I'm ahead of the game. Mo, can you, can you hear me? And can you talk? Yes. Good morning, Bob. How are you? Oh, awesome. Awesome. I figured something out technologically. I'm ahead of the game. (laughs) So everybody, since since I'm not a co-host right now, I would really appreciate if you would put any of your questions that you have. If you don't want to be a speaker, just put them in the Twitter thread where we're listening live right now. And I can read those to Bob so he can answer you. Otherwise, just go ahead and request to be a speaker and ask your question. And remember to please be respectful of time and just to keep a like a one and done. Hey, Bob. Okay. Keith, I think I, I allowed you to, to speak. So go ahead. I'm happy to answer your question. I appreciate it. Can, can you hear me okay? Sorry. Yeah, I'm you're actually, fine. Uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you again for, for the time this weekend and today. I wanted to ask you, when you're making these prospecting calls, is there, is there a certain way that you're, you're finding the information, the, the contact information for these people? Are you looking, you know, are you just kind of going tax record, finding their name and kind of reverse engineering it from there? Or, or how are you, how are you finding how to contact Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, fortunately in New York, the, the volume of publicly available data is pretty good. So <clears throat> always, always a way to, to find out the information. In the old days, you know, we used to see what was publicly available. We'd call the neighbor, we'd call somebody that we knew did business with, with the owner any way you can. But, you know, that's one of the benefits I said, if you call and get hung up on, at least, you know, you have the right phone number, but I think you have to use any available databases you can to try to get that information, tax records, city records, you know, ask other people. A lot of times real estate folks know each other. Maybe somebody else you have a good relationship with knows that person, but whatever you can do. And that's, look, if the, the harder the information is to get, the better it is actually, because it's like that elusive prospect that keeps hanging up on you or won't talk to you. They, it's like that for everybody. And most brokers, they're going to try you know, to find the information they can't find it, they'll hang, they, you know, they'll stop trying. So it actually leads to, I think, a good, a good prospect. That sounds good. And if you don't mind, just to follow up on that, when you do talk to somebody that maybe is not quite ready, or maybe they show an interest, but they're kind of hesitant, do you, do you have a set plan of how often you talk to them after the initial contact? Is it once a quarter? Is it once a month? Or how often do you try and touch them and just kind of? Yeah, well, in? with the, the 1,000 to 1,200 prospects in the, the primary target audience, you should be able to get to them once a quarter. And, and but also, we're, it's not just the call. You're sending a piece of mail, a hard mail once a month. You should be sending them an email once a week. Send them a text message. Try to, you know, invite them for coffee. Ultimately, you want to get 
face-to-face meetings with people. I know a lot of a lot of folks believe that the in, main intent of prospecting is to get a meeting, and a face-to-face meeting is the best thing you can have. But it's it's just to it's just to get as many to re, start relations with as many folks as possible. Calling is the best way to do it, most effective. But you want to ultimately get meetings. But you want to be interacting on all these different in all these different ways to further develop their relationship with them. All right, Bob, we have a question from Aaron Davis off of the Twitter thread. He says he's curious about the size of time blocks and the number of blocks and the number of dials, as well as how many days per week. Okay, Uh, calling generally is prospecting calling for me is usually five or six days a week. And when it's five days a week, that's not always Monday through Friday. There are some days I do calls on Sunday and sometimes I call some folks on Saturdays. I found during the pandemic, there was almost a, a blending of weekdays and weekends. And I think that still hangs around a little bit. Some people, very, very few get annoyed when you call them on the weekend. That has been a rarity. Most people I find a little more relaxed, have a little more time and have a different type of conversation when you talk on the weekends. So, you know, I think, you know, I want to get to my, my ultimate goal is 100. I'm trying to talk to 20 people a day in terms of number of dials, which is completely irrelevant. I rather dial the phone twice and talk to one person than dial the phone 100 times and talk to none. But sometimes, you know, to get to 20 connections a day, maybe I have to dial 40 times and sometimes I might have to dial 150 times. But what I try to do is allocate those two to three hour blocks in the most highly, the highest probability time slots, which I believe are from 10 to 12 in the morning and two to five in the afternoon. I think if you're calling somebody between noon and two, it's likely they're going to be out at lunch or it's just the, the, the probability of connection is highest during those five hours, which we call money time, which is 10 to 12 and two to five. And Mo, was there a third? I thought there might have been a third question in there. Did I get that? Yes. We have a couple more questions. So David Evans says, what's your prospecting cadence look like? Do you call first and then email or is it reverse? Well, I'm I'm doing emails every once a week. So people are always getting emails from me and depends when during the quarter I'm calling them. But you know, I make sure every week I have a different kind of message that I want to convey and depends which clients I'm calling, what I'm going to say to them, but always calling. If I leave a message, I will leave a voicemail message and then immediately send a text. Again, another good byproduct of the pandemic was that I have probably 90% of the cell phone numbers for my clients today. And so that is a, that, that's a great thing. So you can text them, but you want to be, you know, moving forward on all fronts, calling, texting, emailing, hard mailing constantly. You want to stay top of mind. You have to very, very repetitively and consistently be moving forward on all of those fronts. Laren Eustace wants to know, and I apologize if I said your name wrong, do you have a scoring system for your prospects and how does that change how you interact and follow up with them? Yeah, it, it doesn't really. That's a great question. I have, have changed my prospecting method now. Well, one of the things I've, I've done for a variety of reasons is I'm focusing a lot on development site sales in New York. And from my walking tour of Manhattan, I identified the 649 top development sites that I would like to sell. And what I've done actually is I, I think I've taken prospecting to a new, a new iteration, a, a better in, iteration where I've actually put them in order one through 649. And the, the number one is the, the biggest, the best, and the site I'd be most thrilled to sell, and so on. And what I do is the beginning of every quarter, I start with number one. I work my way down the list. I should definitely be able to get to them within a quarter. But to the extent I got to number 526 and the quarter ended, 
first day of the next quarter, I go back up to number one. So I know I'm hitting my top prospects a minimum every quarter. And to the extent I got through all 649, I would go either to a different list of folks that I'm prospecting to, or I'd go back up and start at number one again. But I think you, you, so the question I think Mo kind of was on prioritization. So I, I think you want to, you want to prioritize and be very intentional about the way you are, you're prospecting. And then in terms of follow-up depends on what's necessary. Typically we're offering property for sale to folks. If they own multiple properties and are active in the market, they generally want to see what's going on, but either follow up with something you talked about on that call, follow up with a market report, a white paper, set up some properties, information they ask for out of the blue. They might say, hey, you know, I I own this development site, but I'm really interested in multifamily. What's happening in the multifamily market? Send them an article you wrote on the multifamily market or a report you did on that. So I think you want to definitely follow up within 24 hours for every call that you make conveying what you, you know, what the, the person wants to see as a result of the call. But, you know, prioritizing who you're calling in a, in a certain cadence and identifying who is the most important of the, the prospects within your target audience is kind of taking prospecting to the next level. Kyle Erthner asks, what is your view of being both an investor and broker at the same time? Uh, I don't know because I'm not an investor. Never have bought property. Don't want to. I, I think a lot of people have done it very, very successfully, and I applaud them. I think it's a conflict of interest. I think if people knew that I was a buyer of property and a broker of property, every time I offered them a property for sale, the first question out of their mouth would be, of, hey, if this is such a great deal, why didn't you buy it? And I, I think I, I've always liked to avoid conflicts of interest for a number of reasons. One, I think they're very, very sticky. Number two, I don't want to ever remember what I say to anybody. So I like to keep life simple and I, I like brokering. I think to, to be an investor successfully, I think is a full-time job and I've got time for one job. So rightly or wrongly, I've never done both. I, I'm just a broker. Elijah Cabezas asks, what is the best resource to provide data to your prospects? And is there any way to stand out as a multifamily broker? There's always a way to stand out. And I'll tell you the best data, the best research you can have is data that you come up with yourself. I I think that the, and this is one of the reasons why I think AI is not going to have a, a, significantly tangible effect on real estate in the short run is because I think generally the data that's available really stinks. I think the data provided by third-party aggregators is not great. The data provided by real estate companies because of a lack of coordination between the research department and the brokers, which is the first line of of getting really accurate data is generally not great. And so I think, you know, you could have the greatest algorithms in the world, but if you're, you're putting terrible information in, you're going to get terrible information out. So I I think you provide your own data set. You know, if you decide you're going to do multifamily sales in the Northeast quarter of town, then how many buildings are in the northeast corner of town? What's the average age of those buildings? What's the average unit count? How many sell in a typical year? How many have sold for the last three years? Is the number of sales going up or is it going down? And anybody who owns a property within the northeast corner of town is going to love to hear that information. So set yourself apart from everybody else. If, if you're downloading a report from a third party aggregator, anybody could do that. That's not differentiating yourself in any way. I, to the extent you can create your own data set, your own market report, your own market research. Okay. Covered Land Play at Untrended YOC says, BK, how are you determining the price per buildable square feet for development deals, whether rentals or condos? What are you listing? 
And are there enough land comps that trade? And are you looking at the zoning, air rights, locations? This seems like a really long question. Is it more of an art than a science? No, you know what? There, There is some art to it, but it actually is is science. And the the science behind it, it comes from, number one, you have to understand everything about the site. Understand, are there bonus programs available? Could you potentially increase the size of the site with adjacent air rights? And this is talking about the New York market specifically. You know, what is the highest and best use? Normally, it's very, very clear what the highest and best use of a site is. Sometimes it's not. I sold a big site, a 400,000 footer at 150 West 48th Street a couple of years ago. That site could have been a hotel, could have been an office building, or could have been a residential building. And we had offers from all three sets of those potential developers, and they were all very, very close to each other. The, the, uh, the top offer residentially was 475 a foot. We had a, an office buyer that was at 480 a foot, ended up selling it to Sam Chang, who's a hotel developer, for 500 a foot. So I think you, you want to determine what the highest and best use of the property is, and then look at the comps. And yes, there are a lot of comps. If The comparable sales on the development side in New York is grossly understated by most people, because... In New York, you don't have a, a big pasture of land that is an obvious land sale. You have a bunch of smaller, older, obsolete buildings that are going to get knocked down to create a development site. And so we look, I have somebody that I have retained to help me just look at every single sale that occurs in New York and determine which one definitely is a land sale, which are definitely not land sales. And which one is unclear whether it's a land sale or not. And we do research on all of those to determine what the intent of the buyer is. I call the buyer, I call the seller. And so, you know, I think my set of land sales is much more significant than exists. And this is another thing, talk about creating your own data set. Yeah, I have my own data set. I I don't want to sound like a jerk, but nobody has the development comps in New York that I have because I do that myself. And so, you know, it, it, it is a differentiator. It's a huge competitive advantage, but I want to take a look at, at those comps. Also want to take a look at everything that is available on the market and what the bidding activity is to, to have the most accurate picture of what something is worth is what are the recent contracts that have been signed and what are the recent offers on sites that you have? A lot goes into it, but, you know, today, you know, we can get our, our land values down to within 10 or $20 a buildable foot with a high level of accuracy based on all the data that we have. That's a lot of data. <laughs> it's a lot of data. Look, I, I'm coming out with a, a NACA land index, which, you, you know, you talk about land value in New York, just about every company will say, Oh, well, last year land in Manhattan traded for $438 a foot, which is like saying the average price of a banana, an apple, a bowling ball, and a baseball glove was $423. They're, they're completely irrelevant. They operate separately. So I've disaggregated the data into average prices for residential rental land, resi condo, hotel, office, and then a fifth miscellaneous bucket for retail, healthcare, education, anything that doesn't fit into the first four buckets. And I have that data going all the way back to 1984. So you, you, it's a lot of data. It takes a long time. But when, when you're done doing it, you have something that is extraordinarily valuable huge differentiator and a huge competitive advantage. We have Shane Connor who's asking, can you clarify what you're doing with your one email blast to your whole target list per week or emailing each 100 contacts you made for the week? Sounds like you would rather be on the side of too much contact and not worried about coming off as bothersome. No, I I think to the extent that you certainly don't want to bother people, but you know, people have the option to unsubscribe from the emails if they're getting too much or the, you know, it's very easy to just delete an email. So 
I, I don't think it's all that bothersome. And I, I think we're the stuff we're sending out, it depends on the week, but it's information on a sale that just closed. We, we put together what's called an ACD, which at the top is titled Another Closed Deal, with information about that, that sale, a photo, the, the, a little map, information about the sale. We will send out setups on properties that we've just listed and coming to market with. We'll do a copy of a, an article I just wrote or a market report or something. I mean, any, any excuse, you just want to get, get in front of them to stay top of mind. So I definitely, I, I rather err on the side of over communicating rather than under communicating, because I think if people really want to know what's going on in the market, they're going to want to take a look at your stuff. Just make sure the stuff has value. You know, I wouldn't send an email blast out saying that, hey, the, 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 you know, the shop on the corner just came up with a new ham and cheese sandwich. You want to, you want to have something that is, is going to be of value and of interest to the folks that you're reaching out to. But I, I rather over communicate than under communicate. So over communicate with purpose. Yes, with value. With value. All right. Russell Tillery asks, what does your opening pitch sound like? Well, it depends what I'm, what I'm trying to, to convey and what the objective of the call is. If I, I truly am calling somebody who is a, a cold call today, and I still do call people that I've never spoken to before, I'm usually calling with a specific intention in mind. Maybe that something happened with that particular type of property that has changed the value dramatically for one reason or another, so I might lead with that. But if I'm just, you know, meeting somebody at a networking event and want to convey what I do, I say, you know, I've been been brokering in, in New York for quite a while and I focus on selling multifamily properties and, and development sites in New York. And, you know, what, what do you do? What are you looking for? And I, I try to make the, the initial intro relatively generic, but then see what this particular person is up to in the in the business and then try to to emphasize the things about my background that I think will resonate with that person. Okay. Uh, how much more time do you have BK? Uh, you know, we can probably go till 1:30. Okay. So we have we have another question from Joe Joe. <laughs> I'd really like to hear about your support behind the scenes, what you do, what they do. I want to know about the blocking and tackling. Yep. Well, okay. So the team and the, the, the composition of the team has varied over the years, but you know, I, I have a, an executive assistant that, that is my admin person that does all of my scheduling, keeping my calendar, basically doing a lot of the stuff that needs to get done, but that I don't need to do. And I think that's an underlying theme in a lot of these, these support positions. You know, she'll make dinner reservations for me, go to the bank, pick up my shirts, do stuff that takes time away from interacting with clients so that I can spend more time doing that. I have a right-hand man, a partner of mine, John Hageman, has been with me for over 20 years. And John kind of runs the, the team of transactional associates that I have. The transactional associates are folks who are, are doing a lot of the integral stuff that needs to get done in the middle of the pipeline. I like to, I, I think on a team, each team member should be doing what they do best. So I try to spend the overwhelming majority of my time putting stuff in the front of the pipeline and taking stuff out of the back of the pipeline and have the transactional associates do as much as possible in the middle of the pipeline, putting together marketing materials, setups, offering memorandum, taking pictures of buildings, going to the buildings department, doing research, showing the buildings, a number of things that need to get done in the middle of the pipeline. I have a director of communications that takes care of all my speaking engagements, my, my mailings, my distribution, my email campaigns. I have Mo who runs my social media initiatives. I do write all of my own uh, content, but wouldn't know how to post it if you gave me 10 years to do it. So Mo does all the posting, administrating my, my social media, giving me tips on what to do, how to do it, why to do it, when to do it. If you're interested in, 
in really increasing your social media presence, I suggest talk to Mo. She's awesome. I have a, a couple of analysts that do a great job. Just they're doing BOVs all day long, which is really important. You know, the, there are a number of things that you need help with, but the the underlying premise of everything when establishing a team is as a senior broker, just figure out what it is that you do best. How do you bring the most value to your team and try to spend as much time as you possibly can doing that and delegate other responsibilities to other people? Rod has popped in and he says <laughs> he wants you to expand on the importance of prospecting in down cycles. Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. I think, you know, you you have to look at down cycles as a time of planting seeds. And I will I'll say that, number one, it's important to, to prospect, to create those relationships, further those relationships and strengthen them. But then you also think about the times that we're in. And I, I'm not really familiar with how other markets around the country are working, but I think that they are. there are challenging conditions all over. In New York, we have a, an office market that is really getting slammed. You know, new construction class A office is doing well. Everything else is is suffering. And our clients who own those buildings are having a really tough time today and they really need help. And so think about wanting to be not just a commodity broker, but you know, someone who's a valued advisor, a trusted advisor. People appreciate when they're helped out when they're having a tough time much more than if you help them out when things are good. So I think it's a great opportunity to to develop a great relationship with people, help them when they're hurting, help them when they really need insight. There's a lot of opaqueness in the market today. And to the extent you can give some clarity to people, give them some insights, give them some help, give them something that's going to make their business a little better. I think it's a great opportunity to create a relationship with somebody on a different level than you can. I think that opportunity is much greater in a down market than in an up, in an up market. And and is that because of time? Well, you have you, theoretically more time to to do the prospecting, but I think it's more because the the, the folks that you're speaking to really need you. They, they need and want insight. They want to understand what's going on. And it's that, that thirst for understanding that would make them want to listen to you a little more or that they, they, they need to hear what you have to say a little bit more in a down, down market. And so that's why it's super important to have what, what I love, what you say is, is don't, don't supply adjectives, supply data. Absolutely. So we have this from Sean. He says, hey, Bob, just started college and I'm super interested in this space. How does he get started? How do I work my way up the ladder? And what steps should I start taking? Okay, I would firstly, you know, read as much as you can to become familiar as you can with, with the business. Number one, pick an area of specialization that you feel really passionate about. There's a million different things you can do in the real estate business. Even if you want to be a broker, do you want to lease office space, rent stores? Do you want to be a mortgage broker? Do you want to raise equity for people? Do you want to sell buildings? Do you want to sell buildings? What kind of buildings do you want to sell? Where do you want to sell them? Figure out what you're really passionate about. I think passion is an extraordinarily important characteristic that successful brokers have. Because no matter how good you are, you're going to have tough times. Passion will get you through those tough times. So, and, and then I would try to get a position at a firm with a top broker that you can learn from and that can help teach you the business and mentor you and, uh, you know, find out what it is that you, you're passionate about and then try to hook up with somebody that you can learn from. That is a great answer. Andy P says, Andy actually has two different things. So imagine you're forming MK in today's lackluster environment. Are you comfort confident you can generate revenue in the first 12 months of operation, considering transaction activity is down 70% year over year? 
Yeah, you know what, Andy? I, I wouldn't feel comfortable we could generate revenue in, in 12 months. I mean, I, in a relatively good market, in ninth, I started in July of, of 84, my career. We made our first deal in March of 85, which is about par for the course, nine months to do a, a building sale. In the early 90s, you know, we started, we started MK in November of 88, and even though the stock market had crashed in October of 87, 88 was still a pretty decent year. It really started to slow down significantly in 89. And, you know, we had some deals that were carrying over, but, you know, weren't making a lot of deals in 89 or 90, 91 during the SNL crisis. You know, if we were starting today, it would definitely be a challenge. You know, I, I think that uh, to kind of uh, put it in perspective, you, you're right that the transaction volume is down about 70%. You know, I think you want to focus on your area of specialization, maybe take the time to beef up your ammunition for when the market does come back. Look for people, very, very, you know, scrutinize every opportunity to see who really has to sell or who really is going to sell and don't waste time on deals that are not likely to trade. That's one of the biggest time wasters in a market like this is, as I said, generally about half the stuff that goes on the market actually trades. I will bet you that less than 25% of the stuff that's on the market today is actually going to trade. So you want to be very careful about who you're working for and, and look for motivation. But would I want to be starting out today? Absolutely not. But it's also, it's an opportunity to to establish yourself and maybe come out of this in a in a, a big way. I mean, one of the things that I always am amazed by coming out of these downturns is there's always a new crop of people that emerge as the the new superstars. And that's whether it's on the investor side, the broker side, the banker side, the lawyer side, there's always a group of people that seem to emerge that were catapulted out of a bad market. And, you know, I think that will happen again. Just a question of who that's going to be. But I think to the extent that you specialize, really become a true market expert, it puts you in a position to potentially be one of those people. The other question he had is, how do you deliver bad news and walk away from a listing you've been working on after not being able to deliver because of unrealistic expectations? And I think I actually know the answer to this one. But okay, well, number one, deliver bad news as quickly as you possibly can. You know, you never want to be in the position where the phone rings, you see it's your client calling and you're like, oh, shit, I don't want to pick up the phone. You, you don't want to be in that position. That's bad. Get get ahead of it. Over communicate rather than under communicate. And you know what? If the if the pricing expectation was unrealistic and that's the reason that you're giving up the listing, you probably shouldn't have taken the listing in the first place. So I would I would try to to discuss as fully as you possibly can the value of the property before you take the listing. Make sure that you're within a, a reasonable range of tolerance for getting that done. And then there are times when the market's going to change on you. Look, the last year, the Fed started raising rates in March. It really didn't impact lending spreads until August or September. There were some deals that we we took in July and by the end of September, the lending market was tangibly different and impacted the, the value that we had given in July was wrong. Immediately go to the client and say, hey, this is the feedback we're seeing. But you want to over communicate, deliver bad news as quickly as you possibly can. Be the one to you. The worst position you could be in is the client calls you and you give them bad news. You should always be calling the client and delivering the bad news. Don't don't respond to a client call with bad news because that means you waited too long. But just give them the bad news right away. And with respect to, to pricing, have that conversation all the time with clients. You know, generally, property owners believe their property is worth a little bit more than it is. That's very, very normal and rational. But you, you try to keep them as educated with regard to feedback as you possibly can. And that's why it's important to report to the client, report what people are saying, keep them fully, fully in the loop. Taylor asks, what do you do if you have a great client who wants to sell a building not in your target market? 
I assume you refer it out. What is your typical referral fee? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it, it depends. It, it depends what type of property it is, where it is, how far outside the market it is. So I, I hate to answer questions with it depends, but it depends. And, uh, you know, typically on referrals, whether we're referring a client out or someone is referring business to us, we typically pay a 20% referral fee on whatever we're going to make. If, you know, I, I don't, I, I, if someone is referring a seller to me or give them 20% of whatever we make, if we co broke the deal and make half a fee, they get 20% of our half. If we make the full commission, they'd get 20% of a full commission, but 20% is our, is our standard. Colin O'Malley asks, he says, this is funny. First time caller, long time listener (laughs) in your track development site sales. Do you also track metrics pertaining to construction costs and, or run your own pro forms numbers pertaining to the development when you underwrite? Yeah, we, with regard to, to construction costs, we try to track that. I will, once a year, I send out a survey to all of my developer clients, ask them what they've seen on the construction cost front. And it's really interesting to see what you get back. And you have to understand that, that people will tend to give you information that is self-serving for one reason or another. But, you know, the most recent survey I sent out on construction costs, it ranged anywhere from they've gone down 15 to 20 percent to they've gone up 15 to 20 percent. So you but you look for consensus, look for the, the meaty part of the bell curve in terms of what people are telling you. But we, and Mo, what was the, the beginning? There was a part at the beginning of the question that. In your tracking development site sales, do you also track metrics pertaining to construction yeah, costs? Yeah, no, we track the, the construction costs, obviously. And we track the pipeline very significantly. You know, with part of the the byproduct that came out of walking around town was we, we have an extraordinarily accurate list of what construction is in the pipeline since we did that walking tour we've tracked every demolition permit and every building permit that the city's issued so our our pipeline of of construction in for each of the five buckets is also very robust but you want to track as many of the metrics as you possibly can you also want to track what's happening with lending rates for construction loans mm-hmm. and acquisition loans because that is a you know that that has single-handedly impacted the value of land in New York since September, construction loan pricing is way up and that's had a tangible impact. But you want to track every metric that impacts the the value of the property. Faraz asks, he said, what would you say your schedule looks like for the week? It seems you're working 24-7. I agree with that. For example, how many hours would you go to cold calling, meetings, speaking engagements, and how many hours would you set aside for downtime? Downtime? What's that? And I, I, the only reason I giggled is because like you will send me emails and it's midnight your time and it's nine o'clock my time. I'm like, Bob, what are you doing awake? <laughs> yep. Yep. And you also get the occasional 5 a.m. email from me, my time. Yes. Uh, but no, I think that there is no typical day. It's one of the things I like about the business. I, I try to block out either two or three hours every day for, for prospecting. I try to mix in at least one activity a day, which is a it would fall under the heading of prospect of networking. Networking, I think, is very important, and the rest of it really depends what's going on. But uh, it's a it's a different day every day. I tend to wake up early. I'm up four thirty or five o'clock. I want to get my workout in before the day starts, and then try to work on things before nine. And after five, nine to five, you're just busy dealing with the whirlwind. And then the weekends are a great time to plan for the week, do things that require quiet thought, reflection, writing. I write all my social media content for the week, generally on Sundays. But look, I, I, I do tend to work a lot. I, I Selling buildings for me is a career and it's also my hobby. I have a wife and a 14-year-old girl that I, I love very much. That in my downtime is, or my non-working time is spent with them. And, you know, that's the, the work-life balance that works for me. And that's, that's a different, 
different thing for everybody, but that's, you know, no, no typical day is the answer. They're all different. Kyle asked, do you think small independent brokerages can still compete with large brokerages? hundred percent. No doubt. No doubt. I think, you know, what, what are the large brokers going to say? Well, we have, you know, a million offices in 4,000 countries and, you know, the, the, you, you have to use your, your pros and cons appropriately. There are pros and cons to everything, pros and cons to a, a single broker operation, small companies, mid-sized companies, big companies, play to your strengths. And if you develop that data set, if you, if, if you came to me, if I was thinking about selling a property, and again, we'll go to the, the northeast quarter of town, and it's a, an apartment building, and you came to me and said, well, Bob, you know, there's 681 of these buildings in this area, and this many of them sold last year. This was the average price per foot. This was the average price per unit. This was the cap rate. This is how the cap rates fluctuated over the last two years. This is what the lending rates are. These are the banks making loans on these deals. I'm not going to care whether you're working out of your basement of your mom's house or you're you're at the biggest company in town. I, I, you're you're the person that is bringing value to me. Nobody else has give, given me that information. Clearly, you know more about the market than anyone else. And I think that's particularly true in the private capital space. I think once you start dealing with institutions for a variety of reasons, folks may they only want to deal with the the biggest shops in town, but that's a very, very small slice of the market. The overwhelming majority of participants in the market are high net worth individuals, families, what we call private capital type folks. And they want to deal with the people who they think can deliver the best value and know the market better. So if you create your data set that is going to allow you to talk about the market differently than anybody else can, you know, there's definitely a place. And I, I think that's why there will always be room for small brokerages and boutique shops if you can differentiate yourself in that, that way. We have a couple minutes left. And Dave at that multi guy says, have you ever considered bringing on a junior broker? Not sure what's meant by that. I mean, we, we hire people all the time although no, not not in the past couple of months, but we, a junior broker to work with me, the, the way we are set up, you know, I have a, a team of folks that are active producers in our private capital space. And so I, I don't quite understand the, the question, but there are, there generally are opportunities to, to bring people on and grow the business. And he can always DM you to clarify the question or email you at bob.nackle, that's K-N-A-K-A-L, at jll.com so that you guys can maybe discuss that a little further. Andy P. had another question. This has to do with generating income, and we have about a minute left. And he says, if not 12 months to generate the initial revenue, is it 24 months? Would you be confident before or at 24 months? Well, I guess the, the best way for me to answer that would be assuming I went to a new market that I didn't know anything about and had to get up and running. Would I be confident I could make money within 24 months? I think so. I, I think that's a good bet. I think, you know, I think 12 to 24 months is probably about right, regardless of market conditions. So I would say, yeah, I feel pretty confident about that. And last question, apologies to everybody who asked questions. Again, his DMs are open, so you can always DM him or email him at bob.nackle, that's K-N-A-K-A-L, at jll.com. Paul asks, he says, which patterns do you see in the type of people who emerge after down cycles? I think it's people who, you know, forge their way through the the down cycle, you, you keep discipline. I, I think it's not necessarily, you shouldn't say through the down cycles, through any cycle. The people who do the best are the people who are passionate about it. They live the business. They love the business. They understand it. They, they quantify it. They have a handle on the numbers. They understand their market. They are a true market expert. And they really just, they, they go after the business with gusto. The, you know, so much of the, the reason why I love the business so much is it is the ultimate meritocracy that exists. 
you get out of it what you put into it and the people who put a lot into it can get a lot out of it as long as you're working smart you have to work hard work smart understand your business but create real value in yourself create value in yourself by being a market expert understanding your niche better than anyone else clients are going to see that right away they're going to they're going to love that they're going to want to work with you if they think you're a real expert and so I think that the people who emerge coming out of any market, whether it's a down market, an up market, medium market, are the people who really master their craft. You, you want to stand out. You want to differentiate yourself. Easiest way to do that is through specialization. And so I think it's the, the folks who really go after it and do the stuff. And, you know, I, Rod wrote a, a great book called Knowing Isn't Doing. And, you know, so many of the things in real estate are not, not magic, not as the secret formula. And I said at the beginning that there were no magic bullets or secret sauces. Well, there really is one, right? I was lying to you. The, <laughs> the, the secret sauce of this business is actually doing it, right? And, and knowing what to do is one thing, but actually sitting there and doing it. Like we talked about prospecting today. Right. A lot of talk. It sounds good. Makes sense. Everybody is doing it. But yet a lot of folks just are not going to do it. And it's having the discipline to actually implement these things, do the things you want to do. And all this is, it's really all about mindset. Right. If you, you just have to decide that this is what you want to do. So if you decide you want to do it, you have free will, you can change anything about your life at any moment, decide I'm going to do a prospecting plan, just do it. But it, 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 it's having the mindset where you are determined to succeed. You know what you have to do to succeed. And most importantly, you actually have the discipline to do the things you need to do to succeed that is the secret sauce of the business. And Rod's book, Knowing Isn't Doing, hit the nail right on the head. You got to do it. You got to do it. And that's where most people fall down. You can listen to me. You can listen to other people. You can listen to Tony Robbins. You can do all kinds of things to understand what to do. But you really have to just do it. And that's one of the reasons I always am a big proponent of coaching. Right. So I urge everybody, get a coach, talk to talk to Rod, talk to people at the Massimo group, uh, get somebody in your corner that will help you do it. it. It's so hard to have the self-discipline to do all the things you need to do. A little bit of help from a coach goes a long way. And if you're able to just do it, I mean, what you can achieve in this business is just absolutely astounding but you just have to do it. So Mo, I'm going to leave it, leave it there. I know we had more questions to get to. As Mo said, DM me, email me. We'll do another one of these in the not too distant future. And I appreciate everybody's time today tuning in. And Mo, you, as, as always, you are a fantastic, fantastic moderator. And I wish everybody the best of luck. Have a great rest of the weekend. Wish everybody well. And to the extent I can help you guys in any way, feel free to reach out to me with any questions you have. Have a good weekend, Bob. Bye.